part four, further analysis and discussion. Right, we're at that point of the show where we the shackles are off. We've got through the content. Uh, there's some fascinating stuff within there. Um, we've stuck exclusively to premarital, extramarital homosexuality. Off the microphone, I was speaking to Ollie a moment ago about, you know, it would have been great for the specification to include some other things in regards to not just homosexuality, but sexuality. We could have looked at, uh, like, sex robots. Tune into the after show if you want to hear us discussing that. Um but if you want to bring in other examples, it's fine at this point. So what are our thoughts on these issues? Is there a is there a philosophical approach that you subscribe to that we can apply to these and and just just unpack anything we haven't had a chance to discuss? Um, well, one of the things I would start with, and this is kind of going right, reaching back to our meta ethical episode, which is that I kind of at least currently subscribing to the idea that we do have moral progress. So the fact that at least in the UK right now, that more people than ever have rights to like freely express their love and to be able to get married by a choice seems to me to be objectively better than what it was, say, a hundred years ago, that the, the rights for women and gay people have hugely improved and that that ultimately is a good thing. Now, that doesn't mean that I would necessarily say, oh, and therefore, like, like everybody can freely cheat on their partners whenever they want and, like, everything's acceptable because that's simply just not the case. But, no, I think it's – we are in a, a good place right now and we seem to be making strides in the right direction in my opinion. I, I found this topic so interesting to research and it, my research went to lots of very different places with it. Um, I find the topic of human sexuality incredibly fascinating um, and just just the history of us as a, as a species. So, I mean, doing my research, I found out that um, human beings are one of the most sexual creatures on the planet. So a gorilla roughly has around 12 to 13 sexual acts per child born, per baby gorilla. And a human being, on average, is roughly about 900 to 1,000 wow. by comparison. These, these, as much as a lot of the things we've been talking about are very contemporary, they're also very, very old and they're very much embedded in us as a species and, and our behavior. You know, a lot of the, the discussions with, with we're talking about Christianity and Christian views towards sexuality, I think they've been quite harmful. I think they've actually, um, I, I understand, you know, the historical significance of Christianity. I understand that, you know, before organized religion in, in ancient times, there would have probably been a lot of, uh, not very moral behavior, so to speak. Um, that there, you know, even the idea of marriage that you should be committed to one person. If you're taking an illiterate person from two, three thousand years ago, that might have been quite an, uh, a helpful idea to help society run and progress. But I think in the modern day, I think a lot of modern religions, especially Christianity, is struggling to keep up um, with with change. You know, the I especially, you know, the point of premarital sex. I mean, going to the first episode we talked about, premarital sex is so common so common even amongst christians Mm. to the point now where you know the church saying well you know you really shouldn't do that what difference does it make majority of christian people have premarital sex it's just statistically true um yes you may have your people that want to wait and you know what if you want to wait that's fine but why should you then restrict other people from doing those things or even judge other people for doing those things i think that's i think that's harmful yeah, and I, I also wanted to add the the importance here uh, be- between the sort of separation of church and state, because um, as Ollie said, like if if you know if if your choice is to kind of follow the the law of the Bible or natural law or the Catholic catechism or, or whatever it might be, where it says that like okay, so there is a particular order to sex which in, in which you're going to partake in to impose that on other people who might just simply not believe that there is a god in the first place just like you there is very little grounds but i would argue no grounds to be able to actually do that uh, at all like if you want to if you want to live that lifestyle and and choose to then do but the moment you become sort of increasingly homophobic or or sort of uh, incredibly judgmental to the point where you could argue being put to death for adultery in certain countries, then I can't ever begin to justify that. Yeah, which is abhorrent and utterly ridiculous. You can't philosophically justify that, I don't think. Um, well, can, can I play devil's advocate? I mean, I'm sat here thinking, I, I often, when I'm talking about my philosophical views with people, they will say, well, that's just your view, and I've got my view, and this radical subjectivism that we're both both right but andy's just established well just just said that he thinks there's this objective moral values or there is there's something better objectively about 
uh, we've made progress. Like women having more rights and homosexuality being morally permissible in society are better than not having those things. And I think that if we're going to say that the there's objective moral values, there's a right or wrong answer. So if some if there is a God, if there's if the Christian God exists, then people should make sure they're following in that the authority is scripture and the Bible and the things we've read from Leviticus, then it, our argument is is pretty bad here, isn't it? You say, how can you justify these things? God has literally said that this is the way. Let's talk about Leviticus, Jack. Okay, so I've got a list of things here that Leviticus also disapproves of, apart from uh, same-sex relationships here. So let's just go through one. Uh, we've got eating blood. I'm sure we would agree that's pretty not a good thing. Um, letting your hair be unkept. It's pretty bad. Um, tearing your clothes. Yes, so you're looking at my Jack. hair, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, Jack would that, fail that one. Um, <laughs> so is that one, is that punishable by death? Punishable or? by death. Oh, um, uh, okay. Apparently, if your children disobey you, you can you yeah, can kill yeah, them. Yeah, that, Tattoos, cool. trimming your beard, um, planting two different types of seed in the same field, um, crossbreeding animals. All of these things are punishable by death in Leviticus. It's a hilarious meme online if you look at it where the, uh, there's a guy who has Leviticus, um, you shall not lay with a man, you shall lay with a woman, tattooed on his arm and someone's put underneath the, the, the reference for you shall not have tattoos, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there's lo- people people cherry pick scripture all the time for their own convenience. Mm. If you're a mean minded, horrible person, and you read the Bible, you're going to pick out all the mean and horrible things in it. If you're a kind hearted person who's into forgiveness and love, you're going to find the kind hearted and forgiving things. If you look at the Old Testament, there is so much stuff in there that most Christians do not follow at all. Mixed, mm. Wearing clothes of mixed cloth. Like, yeah. how ridiculous I'm, I'm is that? I'm with you. I agree completely. There's a deep hypocrisy with cherry-picking scripture. But my, I think my point still sounds philosophically when I say, you say to me, how can you say it's not morally permissible to do these things? Well, yes, you're wrong if you're contradicting your ethics in terms of following the scripture in Leviticus. But if God exists then surely you should follow these teaching and they're objectively right. That That's the will of God. Do you see what, what I'm trying to articulate here? I'm, I can see it, but I think the, here therein lies the problem, which is that, so, right, does the Bible without without doubt prove the evidence of a God? And unfortunately, like, and even, even a, most religious people would have to concede that there is no absolute 100% proof that the Bible proves God. I mean, there will be some people that make that claim, but... They can't, to be as convincing as they can be, they, they simply can't actually allow that to be the case. Can I turn it down very slightly then? Can I say that Ollie says, you know, I don't see how anyone can justify that, but Plantinger argues that we can hold faith in God on the basis of Scripture as reasonable. Remember what we did on Reformed Epistemology. So belief in God uh, and following the Scripture is a reasonable worldview to hold. So if you think it's re- if it's reasonable, then someone is justified in holding these views. It's potential i mean i'm i don't know i okay let's i'll concede in a hypothetical situation right so it is reasonable for someone to hold that scripture for them proves that god exists now but i would also argue that it's reasonable to hold that scripture does not and so you right. end up with the same issue which is that okay so we're living in a in a society where like if you have no religious freedom then people are persecuted for all sorts of things. Um, and that if surely by the very same basis of saying, right, so the Bible is, it's rational or it's reasonable to believe in God based on the Bible. It's also equally reasonable to believe in Allah from the Quran and so forth. And that which one of these is fundamentally right? Well, ultimately, I think it's very difficult to do that. I mean, this, this country has been through this whole issue already. You, you, like, go back to the episode where we talked about John Locke in political philosophy. Locke was a huge advocate for religious freedom because he understood that the Bible was a very hard book to pin down and say, we have real, real proof here. That if you then impose all of these things, beliefs from the Bible, it it causes huge problems. Yeah. Like, I just don't see it. Like, uh, you, okay, it's reasonable for an individual to believe that, but it's not reasonable to impose all of that onto somebody who doesn't believe I, it. I agree and you know I was being quite flippant with Leviticus you know there's a big difference between is it reasonable to not plant two seeds in one field that doesn't really impact much but you know what if you if you stand there and you say that I think a certain demographic of people are not only sinful in their natural sexual orientation that has massive ramifications it's not the same as planting a seed and growing a plant it's mm. you know we talked about that you know the consequentialist idea with the utilitarianism of guilt 
um, you know, there's some countries in the, in the uh, on on the earth still where you can be arrested and killed for being homosexual, which is, and the science proves this: the way you are born, it's not a choice. You don't have a choice whether you fancy boys or fancy girls or fancy whatever you like. Even if I really want to, I'm never gonna fancy Justin Bieber. I just can't will it to be. It's not how it works, uh, nor would I want to, even if I could. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I have much better taste. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, Justin, if you're listening. Um, but that's the point, isn't it? Like, it's it's an orientation, and yeah, I think it is unreasonable if you think that scripture or God justifies your disapproval of other people's sexual behaviour. That is that that is unreasonable to me. Um, mm, I that I agree with you. It's that last part is really difficult for me to to accept i it, is it unreasonable if god says if you're reasonable and justify in holding the view that god exists then and that's a big proviso i mean the, the underlying issue is does god exist and are these grounds for for ethics that that's the ultimate question but if we go on the proviso that that is true then surely that they are justified in holding, uh, in judging someone, just as God, if God exists, God judges someone for being sinful if they engage in homosexual acts. Why is the Christian not permitted to have the same moral code as God? You, it's a big thing to swallow right. there. Okay, so let's take this tact then. So, right, we, we can't say that the Bible is in fact definitely the word of God whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Like we can, like somebody could believe that to be the case, but like there is, like just apply biblical hermeneutics. If you're looking at the Bible and analyzing all of it, then we begin to see that there are several different authors to the Bible. They like certain cases there are particular spins or interpretations in which the particular writer wants to put across to their like their readership and that it and you look at the cultural context in which they're in and you then start looking at as to like how does god himself change throughout the bible because the old testament god seems to be somewhat different to the new testament even like just there are are potentially way too many contradictions within the bible itself to hold a firm like ethical stance to say that homosexuality is fundamentally absolutely wrong and punishable by death isn't clear enough in the bible because you can look at leviticus and then go to the gospels and get a different message okay i concede god exists i am a christian now i'm a follower of the of teachings of jesus jesus never talks about homosexuality surely for me as a christian there are a hundred other things more important to my idea of how to live uh justly than homosexuality um yes you could argue premarital sex and extramarital sex may be important you know you know uh, fulfilling your telos etc 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 but especially with homosexuality i should be concerned with um massive payment inequality between men and women i should be concerned with child poverty um the illiteracy of people in third world countries those are the things that I should be focused on, surely, mm. as a Christian. You know, Jesus says it was you to sell everything you own um, and give it to the needy. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. Only the, you know, only the poor will fit through the uh, eye of a needle to get to heaven. OK, like all of these things, surely, which Jesus talks about multiple times, promoting peace, forgiveness, love. All these things he talks about at length, constantly, nonstop. It's almost a bit boring. <laughs> homosexuality he never specifically references so if you read the bible and the most important thing you can take from it well the bible says that homosexuality is wrong what about the pages and pages and pages of other stuff which is also important um yes it is a very controversial issue now and i can kind of see the historical side of it as well right so if you're if you're promoting a nation a christendom which is a word we don't really use anymore you want people to keep increasing in number you don't want them to get distracted with you know, people of the same sex, because they can't increase the number of the population of the religion you, you're promoting. But Jesus specific, I mean, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but someone went through and added up, you know, the percentage of the amount he talks about, like peace, forgiveness, and then in comparison with like sexuality, and it's it's barely like five or three percent. It's tiny. Surely if you're a good Christian, let's concede that God exists. Let's say you're a Christian, you're fulfilling your natural moral law. There are so many more things that were important to you than 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 sexuality Hmm. um so many other more current more you know poverty okay come on we're in a living in a country with increasing homelessness with austerity um surely you should be campaigning social justice and that should be your priority not worrying about what other people do in their bedroom it's none of your concern okay um yeah good i think that's a very good response you've just made um i'm not a qualified to i haven't thought or or read enough to to have a a good opinion on behalf of the theist on this so i'll i'll abandon my post (laughs) just just very quickly i mean because i don't 
I'll just keep going back to that same point. Like even even if they in their in their belief system believe it to be wrong, that I just don't believe there is grounds to then like force people like to you can see the motivation that they want to get someone into heaven. Like if you if you know it's wrong and the goal is to help your your neighbor get into heaven, surely you would you would coach them into thinking about this issue further. Is is this not the motivation? You, Depends on yeah, but then the, this always depends on like how on earth they believe that to, like to to be the case because like depending on which stance you take on like how you get to heaven, so like some people will say it's just through the like grace of God alone, mm. and therefore nothing you <laughs> nothing you try to enforce in law is going to make a difference yeah. with that or universalism, like, yeah. which is the idea that everybody goes to yeah. heaven anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you could take take a position like someone like John Hick and just say like mm. like ev- everybody will eventually get there, like it. There is, there's not a clear cut thing that says like, and here's the way to get to heaven. Like that's not what I'm, I'm saying Christian is, theology s- seems to offer us. I see why people would lobby governments or prescribe moral uh, values if it's ordained by the Creator God, and if by do not kill. I lobby the government into having the law do not kill because of my the baseline is this Christian value. And yeah, this doesn't but, seem absurd then, like, to me. Sure, I see no. the reasoning there. And what I'm saying is the proviso I don't accept that God exists or that the Bible is legitimate grounds for belief and ethics. That's not the issue which I'm saying. I'm saying if one thought that the that God exists and the Bible was a legitimate grounds for authority and we had they had the reading that the Bible condemns homosexuality, then and only then, if and only if that was true, then they would be, you could see why they'd have the desire, the motivation to prescribe that others fulfill this. Right. And uh, just the last, because I think we, we could risk kind of just talking in circles here, but like, <laughs> would would that same person, that same Christian be equally okay with, say, like an Islamic lobbyist who is trying to uh, like promote a particular Islamic stance on, on other issues? No. And like, they probably wouldn't. And therefore, like, which one of those is the correct version of the of the mm. the story and uh and hence we're going back to that religious freedom thing to try and force anyone into like salvation no yeah and it's, and it's difficult isn't it because obviously the uk is historically a you know christian majority country especially since roman times so you know we've got a lot of cultural baggage here uh marriage as an institution is in a bit of a weird place at the moment because Less people are getting married. Actually, I think I recently read that divorce rates are actually going down because less people are getting married. So people are actually only actually doing it if they feel like they're actually going to, you know, mm. not split up. It wasn't something you feel like you have to do. It's more of a choice. Uh, marriage is going down. These traditional values, so to speak, are going away. So, you know, maybe a Christian feels like it's their duty to promote, um, you know, Christian teachings that pre marital sex is wrong, that extramarital sex is wrong, that you, sh- that you should get married. And maybe that's a reaction against the fact that less people were getting married. Maybe it's the idea that they're promoting a uniquely... I mean, marriage existed before Christianity. Mm. You know, marriage has been around since pretty much the, the beginning of human society, in a sense. So, you know, there's there's so much here to kind of unpick in terms of like the... the and, you know, even just like the cultural expectation of what you, what you should and shouldn't be doing. I, I feel that it's just unfair that people feel like they have to get married at all. Why? Like, you don't have to get married if you don't want to get married. Why should you feel social pressure to do so? Um, and a utilitarian would would say that you know if that creates more unhappiness than happiness, then again, like just get rid of it. I agree with a lot of what you've both just said, especially Ollie, when you mentioned uh, you think that this idea might be dangerous and and on on secularism and religious freedom. There seems like we might be at risk of breaching the harm principle or something like the harm principle when the Catholic Church says that acting on homosexual inclinations is evil, is is sinful and against the will of God, it makes me think back to that Stephen Fry Hitchens debate, which I referenced very, at the very start. And Stephen Fry gives a very powerful argument to say, you know, is, is the Catholic Church as a force for evil because it tells the world that all, homose- all homosexuals are evil? And this seems against the values of Christianity itself. It seems that the, if we really want the love and compassion and to follow Jesus, then they wouldn't be saying these things. And it's, it's just sexuality and, and you know, Christianity and the Bible is just interesting full stop. Even the idea that monks should be celibate. I mean, we haven't talked about celibacy really, but that's a completely another kind of 
a can of worms you could open with some people saying that's just unnatural, right? Even St. Thomas Aquinas would say that if you're trying to kind of fulfill your telos and have sex within a marriage, then why on earth would you be celibate to get closer to God? Too fair. Surely, that's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? We, uh, Aquinas talks about this idea of celibacy, um, and he says that uh, basically along the lines of because the vast majority of people will continue to have sex, a few individuals who choose to abstain to dedicate their life to God would not in any way affect the overall kind of ultimate telos of humanity so um but then like if you're making cons like concessions there then like why couldn't you say the same thing for gay sex like the you know yeah it's most a... people uh well i think statistically yeah, most people are heterosexual around the world so if, if homosexual people want to have homosexual sex and that's surely the same end result as a as a celibate hmm. priest right yeah let us stop the discussion briefly to hear from our sponsors let's hear first from recover me Recover Me offer mental health first aid training, which teaches people how to identify, understand and help a person who may be developing mental health difficulties. In the same way we learn physical first aid, mental health first aid teaches you how to recognise those crucial warning signs of mental ill health. Recover Me can provide in-house training or you can join one of their organised training courses. All instructors are Mental Health First Aid England accredited trainers in addition to working in the mental health sector. Recover Me want you to have an enjoyable two days training and leave the course with new knowledge, skills and confidence. Contact michelle at recoverme.org.uk for further information. That's michelle at recoverme.org.uk. The email is also in the iTunes description. Head over to www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. There you'll find all of our new bonus shows, including the Cantian Cafe, the After Show, and pre-releases to all of the new episodes before they're released. If you're listening to this now on the Patreon, you're listening to it weeks in advance as everybody else on the main feed. By helping us on Patreon, you support the show and all of our future projects. Thank you for your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. Cool. Uh, concluding remarks then. Uh, I'll, I'll begin and pass them on afterwards. As I've mentioned in the past, I think me and Andy are due a discussion on this because we, we are disagreeing perhaps. Um, I'm subscribing to hedonistic utilitarianism and most of the issues here, we need a, I've found it difficult to engage fully with the discussion because the, we've probably used a handful of concrete examples which contain most of the considerations that need considering. And as a relative hedonistic utilitarian, you need to have all these facts and considerations involved in your decision making. But for the most part, well, it's just obvious to any utilitarian that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with uh, extra marital, premarital sex, homosexuality. It's just open to the circumstances. And more often than not, providing that everyone hasn't signed up for something they don't necessarily know they're signing up for, and as long as all considerations have been weighed up, then as long as pleasure is outweighing the pain, then that's fine. So you can justify homosexuality, um, any form of sex really, on, on utilitarian grounds, in on what we've discussed today anyway, premarital, extramarital, homosexuality. So, yeah, I find myself disagreeing with a lot of the views we've given. Um, perhaps we'll return to something to do with sexual ethics in the future again. It's been a really good discussion. I've really enjoyed diving into some of the theological stuff, which I don't have a full appreciation of yet in my philosophical career. But, um, yeah, it's been a really good discussion. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed the discussion very much. Um, I find that uh, tackling opinions you disagree with definitely helps you identify where what you think. Um, you know, I'm someone who strongly disagrees with a lot of the Christian teachings about sex and sexuality, and, and, I, and I do believe that they've been quite harmful throughout history, and that hopefully in the future we can kind of slowly untangle them and hopefully help everyone feel more comfortable within their own uh, sexual kind of uh, being, because we're human beings. Human beings are by nature sexual, um, and I don't, and I, I hate the thought that some people. Um, through no fault of their own, are persecuted and in some cases even killed for that. I think that's I think that's unfair. Uh, when it comes to the topics we've been talking about, you know, premarital sex and extramarital sex, um, I think that you know I quite like the utilitarian arguments, and I think most people use those to justification for premarital sex or um, even with uh, you know homosexuality that it doesn't hurt anyone, the pleasure principle, um, and that you know it feels good. Um, so I don't think that the 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 
the arguments that it should just be in a marriage really count in the 21st century. I think marriage is an institution that is um, going to change um, in the future. And I'm quite eager and keen to see what happens. It's quite exciting, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it just... Uh, very similar sentiments. I think we've had a, quite a good discussion about this stuff, and I think uh, discussing religion in, in in the way that we have, particularly in the in the last sort of half an hour, is an important discussion to have. Uh, it's obviously had a very big impact on the tolerability and legality of these things in in the world, and it's still very much the case in other countries outside of the UK. Uh, but, you know, if you look at places like Africa, where uh, and in the Middle East, where homosexuality can be punishable by death uh, the ideas of extramarital sex can also be taken incredibly seriously um sadly you know some some people if they cheat on their partner can can also be looked on such shame within their families that they can also either be shunned or killed um so this this stuff matters and this is why i like talking about ethics because it really is something that i believe to be an important thing to talk about um as far as my particular stance uh, i'd certainly with all all three of the major topics we've talked about always look at consent and dignity um like if you're in a relationship and you want out then you need to be honest with your partner and you need to have that discussion with them and if you cheat on them outside but like before you have that discussion then it's something that well i can understand mistakes i think like you have to admit fault and, and maybe just and and like if you cheat on your partner again try and tell them as quickly as possible as to what has happened it's only fair i suppose if someone is putting their trust in you that you respond correctly to that particular thing um particularly if you're married right like you make a very big commitment there um again with with ideas of consent where like when we're talking about like the utilitarian thing if if a couple want to kind of explore other sexualities and stuff like that and they both consent to it and then they sleep with other people then that i p presume is entirely completely fine for that for those two people who are doing it and finally with homosexuality um I, as far as i'm concerned there doesn't seem to be any strong argument to suggest that, that like they should not have exactly the rights in which they are now awarded in the uk uh, and and therefore as i mentioned earlier i think progress has certainly been made in that regard i'm excited for this one oh, pop, 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 i have no idea <laughs> what this is going to be <laughs> Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy Quiz. Hello and welcome back to Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz, everybody's favourite part of the show. Whee! So uh, this episode we're playing Let's Talk About Sex Baby, Let's mm -hmm. Talk About Andy mm -hmm. and Me. Oh, So uh, <laughs> what I've done yeah. is I've listened back to previous episodes of oh. the Pan Sidecast. Ollie, you're, you're our contestant today. I'm going I'm to give you quotations mm -hmm. uh, from... Oh, you can play as well, actually, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for allowing that, Jack. Um, but the quotes are just from me and Andy. Oh, okay, Sorry, so okay. you're going to be the main contestant. <laughs> well, well, why am um, I you don't, not you don't say quotes? very many controversial things, really. I don't. You, no, maybe you, I should be more edgy. I think Andy's reined himself in a bit more, as we'll see. He wouldn't say any of this stuff now. I'd, it's quite interesting to hear. <laughs> the, the, what, the, are these like off-the-cuff jokes, or are these no, actual just things I've said? Right. We'll see. Well, right. I look forward to hearing these, because yeah, yeah, I haven't no, listened I wanna... back to that stuff in ages. So, so it's either going to be you or Andy. Yeah, do you want to come up with a buzzer each? Ollie's buzzer goes something like this. Buzz. And Andy's probably goes something like this. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Real creative stuff here, guys. <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we've given up <laughs> on this. It's been a long day. Yeah. I didn't want it to be premarital sex. <laughs> yeah, can we do that inappropriate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Quote number one. We're going to give you a quick recap if you're lying in bed doing something. <laughs> uh, that's that's me. That's, no, that's no. me. Unfortunately, oh, that's, that's that you. Oh, yeah. I know that's natural law. Yeah, that's natural yeah, that law. was because I remember the minus talking, one that was Andy. the masturbation thing. Yeah, yeah. sorry, that's minus oh, one, yeah, Andy. Minus okay. One, Andy. Yeah. To be fair, we can get to masturbation later. Uh, that that is me. That's you. Uh, that's zero, that's a reference zero. to the primary precepts. Uh, sponsored by Pepsi Max, maximum taste, no uh, sugar. That's that's me. That's, that's you. That's, there you go. <laughs> Wait, can you complete the quote? That, that's uh, sponsored by Maxi Max, uh, <laughs> maximum taste, no sugar. That's all the quote I've given there. <laughs> okay. Uh, one nil to Andy. Are you implying that she, i.e., Jesse J, is some kind of prostitute? Buzz. <laughs> Andy. Andy. Very yeah. good. That's <laughs> like out of context quotes. <laughs> uh, I live my life as a free agent who is willing. To to ruin Buzz. everybody else's Jack? Yeah, that's no, good. that's you. No, well, that's <laughs> <laughs> you. Said sarcastically. That's just a Cantian's perspective. That's two one to uh, two one to Ollie. I'm suspecting they, i.e., some berries, look very Buzz. poisonous. I'm hoping he dies. Buzz Jack. <laughs> 
That's Andy, unfortunately. <laughs> what's, all wait, Andy? Yeah, what's the context for that one? That one was uh, situation ethics, and you found yourself in a forest. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah, 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 it yeah, was. Yes, that was the choice. The, yeah. to feed him berries. Yeah, good. And rather than follow the thought experiment, <laughs> Andy broke the walls and said, well, I'm just hoping they euthanize him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what, again, I'd like to... No, these are all, these are all jokes. Um, so that, I don't think that one was a joke. That was... Oh, that was me you, saying... Yeah, but I like, agree with you that that actually that was, is a... That's that the right might be the most do. loving thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's the score there? I've lost like, count. I think it's one, I think. No, 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 no. I think because if it's, it's minus... One, if it's minus points, it's one all, yeah. One all. Okay. Um, I don't think Oscar Wilde had a beard. Uh, Jack. No, that's you. That's uh, one nil to Ollie. What's the... Oh, I don't if remember If he did, it would be pretty wild. <laughs> that was... Jack, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> Cor- <laughs> corny puns. <laughs> that's 2-0 to oh, wait, which, Ollie. Which episode was that? Um, I can't remember. At the end of the episode, I asked you who would win out of a fight between Oscar Wilde and somebody else. Oh, I don't even remember. It's such yeah, classic kind of, episodes. Yeah, yeah. Please <laughs> don't listen to them. And finally, for the win here, we'll play Last Point Wins. I can't pay, with, I can't pay for Buzz, this with money, Andy. but I will kiss you. Andy. No, that's a trick question. That was Ollie Marley. Oh, unfortunately. Why did I say that? Yeah, this... And that's, that wasn't even on the podcast. That was just you in a shop. I think. <laughs> that's, yeah, that, so, was, just, that was just a, Ollie's proposition to Jack. The... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pan Psychast. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Pan Psychast for our extra shows. That's the Kantian Cafe and the after show, which we're going to record now. We're about to pop some non-alcoholic beers and get into some exciting philosophy. Uh, not that this hasn't been exciting. It's been a great episode, and uh, I really hope you've enjoyed it too. Next episode, we have an interview with Daniel Dennett. Make sure you've submitted your questions already. The deadline for that, I believe, is the 16th of March. This might already be out, so if you're listening to this on the Patreon, obviously you listen to this tomorrow, because as soon as it's edited, it's already out to those people. Apologies if you haven't signed up for that already and you're listening to this afterwards make sure you don't miss out next time get over to our patreon please twitter at the pan sidecast we love to hear from you share the podcast if you want to support the podcast go onto our website you can either leave us a review on itunes we've got a big list of them on the website too a five star review tweet us share us subscribe to the patreon those are the ways which you can help us we've also added the life you can save onto our pan sidecast website don't just support us there's people who are more in need than us so head over to the panpsychast.com forward slash charity and perhaps sign up to uh to regularly donate to people who could need the help thank you for listening to the wonderful beautiful soothing voices of mr ollie marley if it hurts no one do what you will and mr jack symes from singer what one generation finds ridiculous the next accepts and the third shudders when it looks back on what the first did And me, Andrew Horton, love thy neighbour.